Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. If you feel like you're in, India, in an Indiana Jones movie this morning, well, here we are. Treasure hunt. Treasure hunt. So obviously, Vacation Bible School begins tomorrow, and we're very excited about that. Sarah and her team have put in a lot of preparation, and a lot of hard work, and the result is all of this, as you can see. So this is going to be exciting for the kids and for the workers and, and for her staff, and so we're very excited to be able to share in this week, and I have a small part to play every day, so if you want to, well, I won't say more about that. <laughs> it might, might, be, might be too revealing to, to talk about it. Just a reminder that our fellowship hour will be in the fellowship hall following the service. We invite you to stay and uh, join us for coffee and snacks. Uh, and uh, you can take note of the other announcements in the weekly calendar that's in the bulletin. Uh, I've had three session members ask me if there's a session meeting tomorrow night. The answer is no, we don't meet in July. We'll meet on Saturday, August 21st. So just keep that in mind. No session meeting tomorrow night. Uh, Sarah? Oh, you can go up there or wherever you, I'll stand up here. Are you turned on? I should be. Yeah. Oh, the batteries have failed. Oh. Well, there we go. Use Can you that hear one. me now? I'll just, ouch, take this off. That's quite an ordeal in and of itself. Well, we have been working really hard this week to get ready for Vacation Bible School. As you can see, um, I really want to give it a special shout out to Mary Zakowski. She is so much more than just an administrative leader she has done so much and all the the rocks that you see throughout the church that have the that are painted with hieroglyphics or have the cracks in she did all of those she's amazing and jerica guzzi smith she's one of my preschool teachers she was here every day connie was here mary smith was here and i had this vision this kind of vague idea and they just made it happen. And so I'm, I work with the best people on earth, so I'm very, very excited for tomorrow. We have 46 kids registered, and so we can't wait to welcome them in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I have need for two volunteers, two people. So if anyone, you or anyone you know, feels like, you know, from 9 to noon, Monday through Friday, there's nothing I'd rather do than be at VBS. Please see me afterwards. Also, after church, I'd like to just meet with all my volunteers just up here in the front of the church, just for a few minutes of prayer. And we're going to move and center this set just a little bit. And it's not heavy. It's just I need a lot of hands on deck. Mm -hmm. So pray for us this week. Pray that our children are blessed, not so much by backdrops and ferns and, and hieroglyphics, but by the love of Jesus that they see in all of us every morning. Thank you. Okay. Now, I didn't think of doing this until last night, but I want to invite all the uh, Vacation Bible School staff to come up here. Sarah, come stand here. And all the, all the people who are helping with Vacation Bible School this week, please come up and stand. And we want to have a prayer of dedication. I want you to see who's helping. Just line up facing the congregation here. And this isn't everybody. Yeah, and that includes everybody. Yeah, anyone who's, anyone who's helping or working with VBS, teaching, snacks, games, anyone who's helping. Yeah, just all move down this way. All right. This is very impromptu. We didn't plan to do this, but I, I thought of it last night. Sometimes I think of my best, best ideas when I'm falling asleep at night. All right. Well, these are the people who are helping, so I invite you to lift them up in prayer throughout this week. 
and pray also for the children who will be coming and uh, pray for God's God to be present and God's spirit to be at work in the lives of every one of us all those who are helping all those who are working and the children who will be come and come and be a part of our VBS program that they'll find the two true, true treasure which is Jesus Christ who Jesus described in one of his parables as the pearl of great price, the true treasure whom we all seek to follow, Jesus Christ. So let's pray a prayer of dedication. Dear God, we pray that you will prepare the way for the young people, the children who will be coming to our Vacation Bible School. We thank you for all the hard work that Sarah and Mary and Jerica and others have put in to prepare our beautiful sanctuary to prepare for all of the stations that will be a part of the week and we ask your blessing on our staff who will be working all this week to minister to the kids be with each of them we dedicate this time and this effort to you for the glory of your kingdom in Christ's name we pray amen and now thank you you may go back to your seats and we will transition now to the call to worship Stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. The church is the body of Christ, living as one, belong to God and one another. The church is a community of faith, entrusting ourselves to God alone. The church is a community of hope, rejoicing and resting in the promises of God. The church is a community of love, where sin is forgiven and walls are torn down. The church is a community of witness, proclaiming in word and deed that life was God with God. The church is a community of worship, with every breath and bone praising God without end. Join us as we sing a hymn of praise, number 430. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says that 
Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us pray the prayer of confession. O God, we give you thanks that by your power you created us, and by your goodness you call us to be your people. We confess that we have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, poor, and oppressed. In your great love, forgive and renew us that we may follow your way to newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to God. I declare to you that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Please greet one another safely. Everybody, how are you? So does it look a little different? It does look like Indiana Jones a little bit. So the theme for Vacation Bible School this week is treasured. Discover sparkly stuff would be the second, the second one. It's called treasured, discovering that you are priceless to God. And you can see behind you, can you look in the treasure chest? Do you see all that? Now don't, don't touch it, because you never know with VBS props how sturdy they are. But what's it, what is this right there? A mirror. Can you see yourself in it? I want everybody to come up and see themselves. Can you guys come along? Allie and Emma, you want to come up and look in the mirror? Can you see? Did you see in the mirror, Amelia? You see? Can you see yourself in there? Do you? Do you guys see yourself in the mirror? Well, you know what? More than gold. Oh, come on up. Did you hear? 
help, can you scooch a little bit so that Allie, and, come on up, come on up. Yeah, do you see yourself in the mirror down there? Do you see that? Can you see yourself? So more than coins and jewels and crowns and gold, you are God's priceless creation. God sent his son because he loves us so much. You guys can see it out now. And he sent his son because he loved us so much that he wanted us to be in a relationship with him forever. And the only way to do that was through Jesus. Yes? What does priceless mean? What does priceless mean? It means it's so valuable that there isn't enough money to pay for it because it's more valuable than all the money, even than Amazon. How did he get all of us? Does anybody know the answer? How did, how did God reconcile all of us to him? When God created the universe and all the world around it, he made us from non-animate objects like sure. rocks and clay. Right? They say scooped up dirt and created us. He did. He, he breathed his breath into us. He breathed his breath into us. And then, like all people, we have good ideas, don't we? We want to do the right thing, and we wake up in the morning, and we want to be good and kind and loving. But then we get out of bed. And then pretty soon after that, something happens, and we're not so kind. And we're grumpy, and we don't like the kind of cereal we're having for breakfast, or we wanted pancakes, not French toast, right? And so then we're not grateful, and we're crabby. And so all that is called sin, when we do things that we shouldn't do, not th when we do things we weren't designed to do. And so the way that we say, I'm sorry to God, is we acknowledge that God sent Jesus to pave the way. Jesus was the one who sacrificed so that we don't have to pay for our sins. We don't have to be punished for everything we do wrong when we love Jesus and we trust him in our heart. So while we are God's priceless creation, Jesus is God's treasure. And we are going to learn about that this morning, and we're going to learn about that this week, and every day for the rest of the summer and into the fall. All right, guys, can we put our hands together? Can we pray? Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and sacrificing so we can be together forever. Help us love you and help us love each other every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's go. By the way, in case you're wondering, I guess the organ has a power outage. Is that right? It's dead in the water. Dead in the water. <laughs> the organ is dead in the water, so that's that's why Liz is playing the piano. But but uh, that was that was a great great way to be led in that hymn, that opening hymn. That was that was wonderful. So hopefully the organ uh, uh, repair people will be in this week and solve our problem. I think this happened once before, didn't it, since I've been here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we continue today with a series of sermons from the book of Acts, that a series I'm calling Being Church in, an, in a World of Indifference. Do you ever feel like the world is indifferent to the church? Yeah, I, I, do, I do feel that. You know, the only time church, the church makes headlines is when something bad is happening, like 
people are fighting with each other or conflict or whatever. So, so but, but most of the time it seems like the world is pretty, pretty much indifferent to us and to our ministry. But uh, the book of Acts gives us some good lessons on how to be the church in that kind of world because that kind of world is, is the world of the book of Acts where the world is indifferent or even hostile to the ministry of the church. So uh, I think there are some good lessons for us. So today we come to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And I invite you now to hear the word of God as it comes to us from, from the book of Acts. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. When they, what they had said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, and the number, the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> o oh Lord, speak to us now through your word, both written and proclaimed and silence all the voices of confusion, fear, and doubt that would draw us away from you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. One of the very fine pastors in our presbytery is Richard Baker, who is the senior pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Dayton. And Richard told a story in one of his sermons about his alma mater. Uh, Richard is a graduate of the College of William and Mary, which is the second oldest institution of higher education in the United States, Harvard, of course, being the first. And Richard said that the Alumni Association of William and Mary has within it a group known as the Order of the White Jacket, or OWJ for short. The OWJ consists of former students who worked their way through college by working in the college cafeteria and food services. The OWJ takes its name from the short white jacket worn by the students who worked in the cafeterias of the college. Whenever they gather on campus for uh, alumni reunions, members of the OWJ will don those same white jackets. In their college days, they were in the language of today's scripture lesson, deacons. The word deacon in Greek literally means one who waits on tables. And the OWJ were those who literally waited on tables at William and Mary. And to this day, they proudly wear those white jackets and you might call that their bond of service. So deacons, I invite you to sit up and pay attention because this is your origin story. Acts chapter six begins. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. The church was growing new people were being welcomed. But growth that includes diversity can lead to conflict. As we saw at the end of Acts chapters two and four, those who were following Jesus had from the beginning shared their resources. 
so that at the end of Acts 4, it says there was not a needy person among them. Now, New Testament scholar Tom Wright points out that this wasn't just a primitive form of communism or socialism, you know, collective ownership of everything, nor was it a sign, as some have argued, that they thought that the world was going to end soon so that they wouldn't need their possessions or property anymore. Rather, it was a sign that they knew that they were called to live together as one family. They understood that God was doing a new thing, creating a new kind of fellowship, a koinonia, a family, if you will, of those who follow Jesus. And like any family in that world, and in today's world for that matter, they would all own everything together. In order to care for one, in seeking to care for one another and provide for the neediest members, the church was following the example of Jesus, remembering how he fed 5,000 people with a, a few fish and loaves of bread, remembering how he blessed and broke bread and gave it to them and then said, do this in remembrance of me. Feeding hungry people didn't start with Jesus, but he certainly raised the bar. Whether we're talking about widows and orphans in biblical times, or migrant families fleeing violence and poverty in our time, or homeless people right here in Clinton County, always God's people are called to care for, advocate for, and strive for justice for the poor, the outcast, and the stranger, the most vulnerable members of the human community. In biblical times, this meant especially widows and orphans, because in a society in which a, a woman's status was viewed totally in relation to the man to whom she was attached, be it her father or her husband or a brother or an uncle, a woman without a family easily fell through the cracks. And so those followers of Jesus reached out. They reached out to the poor. They reached out to the needy. They reached out to widows and to orphans. According to historians, one of the chief reasons for the rapid growth of the Christian church during the first two to three centuries was precisely this, the way Christians reached out to those in need, to, to orphans and to widows, to abandoned infants, to the sick, to the incarcerated, and so on. Justin Martyr, one of the fathers of the early church from the mid second century AD described the charitable work of the church in this way. Those who are prosperous and willing give what each thinks fit, and what is collected is deposited with the president, who gives aid to orphans and widows and those who are in want on account of illness or any other cause, and to those who are in prison and to strangers from abroad, and in a word, cares for all who are in need. When the early Christians sought to care for each other and provide for the most vulnerable of this new kind of family, they were following the example of their Lord who had said, as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me. But what do you do when the family suddenly grows larger than you ever expected it would? That is the situation facing the apostles at the beginning of Acts chapter 6. The church was growing. New members were being welcomed daily. And in the midst of all that happy chaos, someone dropped the ball. Someone lost the list of people to be served. Someone forgot when it was their day to prepare the meal for the homeless, the widows, and the orphans. And those who complained about being left out were from a different ethnic group. They were Greek-speaking Christians called Hellenists from other parts of the Roman Empire, as opposed to the Palestinian Christians who spoke mainly Aramaic. Maybe they were afraid that as newer members of the church, they were not as valued as the original pillars of the church. Whenever people try to live in community and share resources, even small differences of background and culture can loom large and have serious consequences. 
My guess is the older original members, those who've been following Jesus since his days in Galilee, might have been worried that some of the old ways were being lost. They might have been concerned about the changes they saw happening, the compromises that were being made, the new ways of following Jesus that the newer members were adopting. This argument between the Hellenists and the Hebrews was probably like many church arguments in that there was truth on both sides. Both sides had legitimate concerns. The Hebrew Christians may have been concerned that the, the old traditions and practices were being lost. The Hellenistic Christians were concerned that their concerns and the needs of their most vulnerable members were being overlooked. And recognizing that things needed to change, that the growing church needed to figure out new ways of carrying out its mission effectively, the apostles came up with a plan. Seven, they said to the people who were grumbling, select seven people of good standing. Okay, they, they did say men first. They said seven men. But women would later be joining their ranks. Check out Romans 16 verse one, by the way. Seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task. And so that is precisely what happened. The people who were feeling left out, who were feeling like their concerns were being neglected, selected seven who were known to be full of the spirit of, of love and wisdom and generosity. Stephen, who Luke says was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And it is no coincidence that all seven of them have Greek names. These seven qualified, capable candidates knelt before the apostles who ordained them for the ministry of waiting on tables with prayer and the laying on of hands. And it has puzzled commentators to this day. Once the seven deacons get selected, we never see or hear of them waiting on tables again. In fact, only two of them appear later in Acts. Stephen, who full of grace and power, proclaims Jesus and does great signs and wonders and is thereupon martyred. That will be next Sunday's sermon. And Philip, who travels to Samaria, proclaims the good news there and goes on to teach and baptize the treasurer of the Queen of Ethiopia. And that will be the sermon in two weeks. If there was a division of labor in the early church, it was not hard and fast. Just as the apostles were to focus their energies and efforts on prayer and proclaiming the word of God, so deacons were called to witness to the grace and the love of God. The dictionary defines a witness as a person who being present personally sees or perceives a thing, a person who gives evidence. A deacon is called to give concrete evidence of God's love made known to us in Jesus Christ. Sometimes they do that as the earliest deacons did by providing food and other support to the most vulnerable people in the community. Sometimes they give witness by visiting those who are because of age or infirmity unable to be present whenever the congregation gathers for worship. Sometimes deacons give witness by bringing the Lord's Supper to those who are sick or homebound. Sometimes deacons give witness by simply listening as someone pours out their heart and by praying with them. Our book of order says this about deacons. The ministry of deacons as set forth in scripture is one of compassion, witness, and service, sharing in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ for the poor, the hungry, the sick, the lost, the friendless, the oppressed, those burdened by unjust policies or structures, or anyone in distress. I know that deacon can mean other things in other denominations. For example, in many Baptist churches, deacons function more like ruling elders. In the Catholic Church, deacons are ordained and perform all of the functions of ministry except for the, the sacraments. But for Presbyterians, the Book of Order says the office of deacon is one of sympathy, witness, and service. 
sympathy, witness, and service. And it is an office, hence the church practice of the laying on of hands. And notice that there, were, there are a number of firsts connected to this office. Deacons were the first ordained ministry in the New Testament. Presbyters, that is elders and bishops, will follow later. The office of deacon is the first ordained ministry many church members will assume. Some deacons will move on to being ordained as elders, but not all. Serving as a deacon is often the first major commitment church members make to the work of the wider church. In Presbyterian churches, the deacons are the doers. You've heard that before, haven't you? The deacons are the doers. They are the ones who visit people in the hospital, prepare the communion elements for Sunday worship, bring communion to the homebound, provide transportation to doctor's appointments for those who don't drive, bring meals to those who have just come home from the hospital, check on their assigned church members on a regular basis, plan fellowship meals and other events, prepare bereavement meals for a family and loved and friends following a funeral service, visit newborn babies and their parents in the hospital, and pray with and for their neighbors in need. And so Earl Johnson Jr. writes in a, a little book that the Presbyterian Church has published uh, that's basically a, a handbook for deacons. He writes, traditionally deacons are people persons. Their hearts go out to those in distress to members who have suffered loss, to neighbors in the hospital, to friends who have lost their jobs, to new parents who are confused by a wonderful, sudden, and challenging change in their responsibilities of life, to new members who need a word of welcome, to members who are shut in and lonely and cannot leave their homes, to people in the community who have lost their way and can no longer find God, to those who are economically oppressed and do not have adequate places to live or enough to eat, to those suffering from natural disasters or the ravages of war, to any people who need to experience the love of Christ in concrete ways. Any of those things, or all of those things, are the calling of deacons. But the calling is not theirs alone. It is ours too. There should be no hard and fast division of labor in today's church either. Deacons are not just doers, but they are also, like Stephen and Philip, proclaimers, often proclaiming most effectively by doing. In fact, we are called to be both doers and proclaimers of the word. We are all called to minister to those who are sick and in need, to comfort the sorrowful, and to befriend the friendless. We are all called to extend sympathy, witness, and service. This is our work. It belongs to each and every one of us. And like waiting on tables, it is hard work, sometimes humbling, often exhausting. And yet, like all service, among the deacons and among all of us, it creates a bond a bond of service that goes back to Jesus himself. You remember, don't you, what he said about himself. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And remember what he said to his disciples. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And remember especially what Jesus did for his disciples. John 13 three through five, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel about himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. Washing the feet of guests was not only the work of servants, it was often, often assigned to the lowest servant in the household. Peter knows this, so he pulls back in disbelief. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answers, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter is adamant. 
you will never ever wash my feet. But Jesus is even more adamant, unless I do, you will have no share with me. Unless we are served by and then serve in the name of the one who came not to be served but to serve, we also will have no share with him. So friends, this is our bond of service. You might even call it an order, the order of the deacons. You don't need to wear a white jacket to make it happen. You just need to answer the call of Jesus right where you are. A hymn by William Brick Bricky put it well. In imitation, Lord of you, this solemn service we repeat. For your example, full of grace, has made this humble duty sweet. Our great example you shall be in washing your disciples' feet. And as we follow your command, Lord, make our fellowship complete. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for the call to service that is ours through Jesus Christ. May we all follow his example and seek not to be served, but to serve and to give witness, courage, and sympathy to all those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you, as you are able, to stand as we affirm our faith today with the Apostles' Creed. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated, please, and we're glad we have Jen and Jeremy to share music with us today. Or is it the whole family? Okay.
Amen. Thank you. That was great. That was great. It's always good to get the kids involved. <clears throat> Again, thank you for your faithful stewardship. And just a reminder that envelope giving and cash donations can be placed in the offering plate right back behind Connie's left shoulder. <laughs> right back on that little table there. So thank you for your faithful giving and support of our ministry together. And now let us unite our hearts in prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace. Lord of all creation, who calls each of us by name, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers of joy and anguish, of gratitude and contrition, of hope and desperation. As we look around this world which you have created and given to us to care for, we acknowledge that so much of what is happening is the result of our human actions and our inactions. So forgive us, Lord, and breathe your spirit into us that we may each commit to doing our part to heal the brokenness in this world that you love and that your son gave his life for. Even as some refuse to admit the realities of climate change, we've seen flooding, tremendous flooding in Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands, unprecedented flooding that has taken the lives of more than 170 people, with thousands more still missing. We grieve the destruction in Henan province in China as a total year's rain fell in only three days resulting in tremendous flooding and the deaths of at least 33 of your children with over 250,000 persons displaced from their homes. We can barely breathe at the thought of the extreme heat affecting large portions of the western United States and the wildfires that have destroyed countless millions of acres of forest, destroyed many, many homes and businesses, and cause pollution from the smoke to spread across our whole nation. We look at this and we wonder why, O oh God, and we grieve for our part in creating a world which this is not only possible, but a reality. Even as some still refuse to acknowledge the continued threat of COVID-19 and the spread of the Delta variant, cases in many African countries where fewer than 2% of the people are vaccinated are surging, and cases surge here in the U.S. in places where vaccination rates are low. We look at this and wonder, why, O oh God? And we grieve for our part in creating this reality out of our human arrogance and our lack of concern for our neighbor. Even as we lift these concerns, we also rejoice we rejoice in the opening of the Olympics in Tokyo, the thrill of athletic competition and the excitement of seeing our nation's athletes representing the best in all of us. So be with all of the athletes, the coaches, the officials, and we pray that you will keep them all safe even as COVID cases are increasing in Japan. Closer to home, we lift our vacation Bible school Bible school to you. We pray for all of the teachers and helpers and for the children who will be attending. And thank you for the ministry that will be happening 
and the opportunity for young people and children to draw closer to you. And we pray for this church as we go forward together seeking to serve our community and to serve one another. May we embrace the example of Jesus who gave his life for us all. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace as we unite our hearts and voices to pray the words Jesus, our Savior, taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 434. We are, today we all are called to be disciples. Please stand as you're able. unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and always. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.